All right, welcome back. Today we're going to look at alternative views on macroeconomic policy. We're going to look at a couple of different uh, theories and models and approaches that economists have used to try and make sense out of this macroeconomy. Um, and this information will be found in your book, Chapter 33, Macroeconomics, Events and Ideas, and the page number is listed there at the bottom. Uh, the goal here for today is to try and first explain the assumptions of what we call Keynesian economics and understand um, what Keynesian economics argues when it comes to addressing uh, economic downturns in particular. We'll talk about what monetarism is and how uh, it is a little different than Keynes. We'll talk about the quantity theory of money and identify the equation of exchange. And we'll talk a little bit about this concept of rational expectations and what that means. We begin, though, with this idea, again, of the classical theory in economics, that prices are fully flexible in the long run, and um, therefore aggregate supply is a vertical line. And so any change in fiscal and monetary policy leads not to a change in output, but simply to a change in price levels. So a change in money supply leads to an equal uh, change in price levels, and a change in fiscal policy will eventually lead to the same output as before, but with higher price levels as well. Uh, and that system worked great. Uh, for economists up until about the 1930s when suddenly there was this massive downturn known as the Great Depression and uh, suddenly economists were trying to figure out what the heck to do about it and so there was not a whole lot of agreement they start with the classical theory but then that's not working for them um, and so they they begin to discuss what the appropriate economic policies ought to be and there's wide-ranging uh, dispute over what the right quote right right approach is and two of the the leading thinkers in that at that time period are, are uh, friends from school one is a guy named John Maynard Keynes, and the other is Friedrich Hayek, and we'll talk more about Hayek in class. Um, but Keynes becomes the guy that, that most people kind of turn to with his work. So there's no agreement between economists on what's going on with the business cycle and what the appropriate response should be. And so we're developing new economic theories. And the first one is this idea of Keynesianism put together by a guy named John Maynard Keynes, um, who wrote the book The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And in it, uh, essentially, Keynes is arguing for an activist macroeconomic policy, that there is a role for the government um, in macroeconomics, and that it's not just going to raise prices, but actually have a positive effect, particularly on output. And a lot of his stuff is um, still generally accepted, still used. Uh, conservatives and, and liberals on both sides, um, to a certain extent, kind of understand and accept parts of Keynes' theory. Um, so a couple of points that he made. One is that aggregate demand is impact uh, can impact actual output. This whole idea of a short-run aggregate supply curve that is upward sloping, which we had talked about earlier in the year, is what drives Keynesianism. Um, in a sense, with a short-run aggregate supply curve, which is upward sloping, any sort of change in uh, fiscal policy or monetary policy not only leads to an increase in prices, but it does chain, uh, result in a change in output. And so the classical theory says that short-run aggregate supply is the same as long-run aggregate supply, and it's a vertical line. And if that's the case, then if aggregate demand were to, say, shift to the left, the only change would be the price level. Output would have remained the same. In Keynes's view, though, um, essentially there is a short-run aggregate supply curve, which is upward sloping. And if that's the case, then an aggregate demand curve that shifts to the left not only changes the price level, as you can see it goes from P1 to P2, but also affects output dropping from Y1 to Y2. At least in the short run, there is some sort of effect. He also talked about this idea of animal spirits and how those would affect aggregate demand. And so we come up with this idea of bulls and bears. So if you're um, bearish, you have low confidence in the economy, and that generally generally leads to less consumption, less investment, and a left shift in aggregate demand. And if you're a bull, you have high confidence in the economy, and it leads to a right shift in aggregate demand. And so uh, people's expectations and feelings and uh, confidence has a direct effect on output in the country. Third thing he said uh, is that fiscal policy is better than monetary policy. He doesn't deny that monetary policy works, but it's just not... Um, as, as useful as fiscal policy would be. So he warns against what are known as liquidity traps, which limit the power of money supply or monetary policy. Because if you continually increase money supply, you drive interest rates further and further towards 0%. But once you get to 0%, there's nothing else you can do. Um, and so as long as interest rates are above zero, monetary policy can do something for aggregate demand and for output. But once you get it to zero, uh, 
um, monetary policy begins to fall apart because you, you have nothing else you can do. Whereas with fiscal policy, you don't have that problem. You just keep spending, and you can continue to boost aggregate demand uh, to the right for as far as you're willing to spend. And so uh, Keynes would argue that monetary policy works to an extent, but not as, as effectively as fiscal policy would. An alternative view to Keynes is this idea of monetarism, and they are more of a monetary policy uh, approach. So they would say that business cycles are caused by uh, deficiencies in the money supply. The business cycles go up and down. The economy grows and shrinks based on money supply. And so for them, fiscal policy doesn't work as well as Keynes believed. And one of the main reasons why is that with Keynesianism, this idea of boosting aggregate demand, particularly to the right to deal with a recessionary gap, that this change in fiscal policy leads to an increase in interest rates because when there is greater output there is now a greater need for money because of the rise in prices. So prices went up I now need more money to buy the same amount of goods so my money demand shifts to the right and if mon uh, money supply stays the same then all that does is results in a higher interest rate and higher interest rates we know leads to less investment and so we see this crowding out uh, of investment, private investment in the economy because the government is going to assume more debt um, and so and, and need to borrow more from the loanable funds market and that leads to less investment and more crowding out and that loss of investment leads to a left shift in aggregate demand. So a monetarist would argue that um, an activist fiscal policy doesn't have as great an impact on output as one might suspect because of this loss of investment. So while government spending is increasing and pushing aggregate demand to the right, crowding out cause, and causes a drop in investment, which pushes aggregate, in, aggregate demand to the left, and the multiplier is essentially diminished. And so for a monetarist, the idea is to increase money supply. So they point to this idea of the quantity theory of money. And the, the crux of it is this ex equation of exchange, the concept that money supply, growing money supply, will lead to a growing GDP. So they say, here's our equation of exchange. Money supply times velocity is equal to the price level times real GDP. So the right-hand side of the equation is essentially nominal GDP. And the left-hand side of the equation is the money supply that's set times velocity, which is the amount of times that a dollar would change hands through the course of a year. Um, and so this kind of goes into this idea of the multiplier, where my spending becomes somebody else's income, which becomes their spending, which becomes somebody else's income. Monetarists would assume that velocity is pretty much constantly growing at a steady rate, and they can, they can um, at least back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they argued that you could kind of calculate that rate. So then all you would need to do to determine the size of the nominal economy that you want is look at the rate the, of velocity and then set the money supply accordingly. And so an increase in money supply should lead to an increase in nominal GDP. And it worked pretty well for a period of time up until about the 1980s. So you can see in the graph that from the 60s to the 80s, it's velocity is growing at a relatively steady rate, but then it goes all over the place. And a lot of reasons why it goes all over the place. But um, one of them may be that banks begin to, to, uh, to pay people interest for their checking deposits. If you're getting interest in your checking account, there then becomes a, a strong incentive for you to keep some of your money in your checking account uh, because you're earning interest, which means that you're not spending as much and the velocity would go down and then it picks up again and so the long and short of it is this we can't really easily estimate what the velocity of money will be which makes that equation then problematic because we don't want to cause massive inflation so if the velocity is going down then we need to increase money supply but if the velocity is going up then we need to actually begin to cut back on money supply and that makes policy making very very difficult a third theory is what we call rational expectations, and that is kind of a replay of um, the classical theory. With rational expectations, um, basically the argument goes that people will make decisions based on available information and what they think the economy will do. So if you think the economy is going to inflate, you're going to act as if it was inflated. And so um, the, the argument would be then that there is no short run. 
aggregate supply curve that's upward sloping, it would be a vertical line because if I think there's going to be 2% inflation as an employer, I will adjust my payrolls accordingly to deal with that 2% inflation. And so when we say that the economy self-adjusts over time, the rational expectation theorist would say that's true and it will actually self-adjust immediately based on what I think will happen. And so for rational expectations theorists, they look a lot like the classical model. That's a crash course. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in class about this guy Keynes, and we'll talk about this other fellow Hayek, and we'll watch a couple of videos, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the different ways that people have come up with addressing the kind of economic problems facing our country today and which will be facing our country in the future. I look forward to seeing you then.